Thank you for coming. Um, we have Professor Milani here as well. Um, so today's topic is inequality, um, focusing on income or um, consumption inequality, not gender or race inequality, which are important topics themselves, but not our, our topic today. And um, this might be a little different than the usual uh, best ideas talk, in the sense that we're going to make some introductory comments, maybe show you some data on uh, what we know about inequality, and then really kind of ask you guys for your thoughts and, and kind of want to talk about what you guys want to talk about. The other thing we want to do is um, introduce a framework that we use in a class we teach across the Midway um, called Big Problems. It's a class that's half law students and half uh, Booth students. It focuses on um, each week a big problem, such as inequality, which is our topic today, or um, climate change, or coronavirus, or trade, or immigration, and so forth. In that class, we've got a basic framework we use for analyzing those problems. We want to kind of use that framework or bring that framework here to the law school um, to show how we can analyze inequality using that framework. But again, most of what we want to do is talk about what you guys think about or want to talk about with inequality. So let me start um, with some basic facts about inequality. Oops, I got to show the room a piece. Is that on there? Okay. So you may have seen this graph before. Um, this is top 1% share of uh, income from 1913 to 2018. Anyone know why it's 1913 is a start date? Because this comes from tax return data. And taxes were first enacted in 1913, income tax first in 1913. And so as far back as we can go is 1913. And the other thing to note about this, because it comes from tax return data, is it's taxable income. Right, which is only a fraction of total income. Right, but this is top 1% share. You've probably seen this one as well, uh, top 0.1% share. And just to go back, the 0.1% share, as you can see, is a little bit steeper. They've grown a little faster than the 0.1%. And if you went to 0.01%, it would grow even faster still. Okay, one of the basic problems with this is that it's taxable income, and taxable income only captures a relatively modest fraction of total income. So the economists that did the first two graphs went back to the drawing board when faced with this criticism and said, well, what, do we, what happens if we look at all incomes? They take all of GDP and they figure out who owns it. Some of it's kind of easy, like your own wage income or your own capital income. Some of it's pretty hard, like spending on the military. Who, who gets that? But what they tried to do is allocate it every dollar of GDP to somebody, so we know we have a full accounting, and then do the same exercise. And you get a graph that looks like this. It's pretty similar to what we just saw, which is the top 1% uh, kind of has that U shape. It's gone up in recent years. And the top 0.1%, which is the red line, um, has a similar um, uh, vector. Their numbers are a little bit lower in this graph than they were in the taxable income graph. But it looks pretty similar when you do a full accounting. The full accounting allows us to do the following exercise as well, which is look at how much the government policy is changing inequality. So the red line in the top is pre-tax income, and that's tax and transfers. And the blue line then shows you how it changes when we add in the tax and transfer system. And what you can see is that the tax and transfer system is reducing inequality to some extent, or at least reducing 1% share to some extent. Right, and we can do the same thing then with the bottom 50%, which as you can see now, the blue line is above the red line. The bottom 50% of uh, individuals in the country now have more income because of government policy than they would have otherwise. Right? The decline is much, much less than it would have been if we didn't have taxes and transfers in the system. Now, One of the hard things about doing this latter estimate, where you allocate all income to everybody, is it's hard to know who owns what income. There's a lot of choices being made in those graphs. And so two economists from the government, one in, uh, in Congress, uh, the Joint Committee on Taxation, and one in the Treasury, went back and redid the data, making some alternative assumptions about who gets which income. Right? For example, who uh, is responsible for paying corporate taxes, right? Individuals show up in this list. So some individual has to be treated as paying corporate taxes. And we're not sure who really is the person who bears that corporate tax. You can make different assumptions. 
So you make different sets of assumptions about who bears different types of income or who owns certain types of income, you get very different results. And so these two economists, Otten and Splinter, reproduce the same graphs you just saw with different assumptions. And what you can see is on the left-hand side is pre-tax income, and the Otten and Splinter results on the red, the ones I just showed you, the Piketty, Sia, Zuckman results in the blue, look quite different. And if you look to the right-hand side with Otten and Splinter, with alternative assumptions, you see that 1% share really hasn't changed since 1960 under alternative assumptions. Another way to say this is we actually don't really know whether or to what extent inequality has increased. Now, this is probably contrary to what you think. There's a sort of popular meme, almost a folk theorem, that of course inequality has increased. We see the entire Democratic campaign, presidential campaign, premised on this idea. We actually don't really even know whether that's true or not. What are some of the difference, differences or drivers of things we don't know that might, might change inequality? Um, unreported income. So we don't know who's evading taxes or not, but kind of by definition. And what assumptions you make about who's evading taxes can affect this a lot. Um, retirement income and pensions. If you allocate people's savings for retirement to the time when they're earning it, inequality looks a lot different than if you allocate it to them at the time that they're retired, because they're generally poorer when they're retired. Uh, corporate income, I mentioned the corporate tax. Um, how you adjust for family sizes. Family sizes have changed since 1960, and how you make adjustments to the units you use affect the results a lot. And so when you make alternative assumptions, I'll go back a slide, you can get quite different results about inequality. So the, actually, we don't really know that much about how much inequality has grown or, or changed over time. All right, one of the problems with the prior sets of slides I showed you was that they were income shares, right? How much of the total GDP does 1% own or the bottom 50% own? And what that does is kind of rig the result because it assumes a zero-sum game, right? That is, when you look at shares, it can't be the case that everybody's better off because you're, if one person gets an extra dollar, someone else has to have a, a $1 less in terms of shares. So maybe a better way to think about inequality is to say, well, how well off are people doing in terms of just actual income? Right? So what this graph shows is that it's got 1% and bottom 99%. And note the axes are different. So if you go to the left-hand axis, that's the bottom 99%, and the numbers there are 10,000, 20,000, 30,000. You can see then the, the blue have gone up uh, over time. Um, if you look at the recent years, say 19, 80 or so to today, you can see it really flattens out. Right? You have this great growth in middle income in the post-war periods where it's really, the blue line is really steep, and then it flattens out recently. And that's an important story to think about in terms of uh, the way we think about today's world. The red line is the top 1%, and note the axis is different. That's the right-hand axis, and those are in hundreds of thousands of dollars. Right? So you can't compare the slopes because the axes are different. And again, you can see great growth in the top 1%, but in a different time period. Really, we're talking the 70s and 80s is where the 1% is growing in, in terms of absolute income. And here's another way to look at it. So rather than looking at 1% and 99%, maybe a better way to think about policy implications of inequality is to break things down by decile. So the bottom 10%, the you know, next 10%, you know, the 30%, 40%. And so forth. And what we've got here is wage growth since 1960 broken down by decile. And this is men. And you can see what's happened is that the top decile's wage growth has grown faster than the middle and the bottom. And as you move up deciles, each decile is growing faster. You see a kind of a fanning out of the wage rates, so the growth in the wage rates over time, right, indicating some kind of inequality. Right, and that then lets you see the picture happening at each, each level of income. And here's the same thing for women. And the women's fanning out is even greater, and the lines are steeper. Right? Because of the feminist revolution, women have entered the workforce more and have done better during this time period than, than men did. Okay, what do we know about causes? I'm going to go through this relatively quickly because it's not the point of the talk today, but it's important to have some idea of what's driving this. Um, if you look at the literature, there's uh, 10 different things people have 
proposed to be driving growths in inequality. We don't actually know which of these 10 is driving it or what combination of these 10s are driving it. But here's some ideas. One of them is that as technology has changed, the rewards that are being high skilled have increased. The economists call this skill bias technical change. And what that's done is increase the wages of people with high skills, say college education, relative to people with low skills, say, excuse me, high school education. Another one is winner take all markets. So think about a violin player in 1950. You needed a lot of them, right? Because in each town, you needed a violin player to perform because you didn't have technology to broadcast that violin player's performance all over the world. Now you only need one violin player, and everyone can watch that player all over the world. So that one person can capture all of the rents that all the players before used to capture. So winner take all markets. Automation, you might see um, uh, computerization and technology driving wages down for people whose work can be substituted, whose work, whose computer, that computers can substitute for their work. And so that might drive some of it. Um, globalization. So increased trade and the competition of many manufacturing jobs with, uh, with Chinese manufacturing. Uh, decline in unions. Unionization has gone down dramatically since the 50s. Um, deregulation might be a cause of inequality, of increase in inequality, particularly uh, you might see labor monopsony. You have fewer employers because of uh, concentration in different markets, and that might drive down wages. Um, tax changes. The tax system has become notably less progressive over the last 50 years. Uh, some people blame immigration, particularly driving competition at the low wage, uh, at, uh, you know, at the low wage levels, and therefore keeping w suppressing wages at the low income levels, but allowing wages to grow at high income levels. Um, changes to social norms, so people now feel more comfortable just taking very very large salaries, where perhaps in the 1950s they didn't feel that way. And finally, some people suggest that it's neoliberalism. It's some in inevitable consequence of capitalism, and it's just the way the system is going to be. All right. We can go into these into more detail, but I just want to put them up without talking about each of them um, in particular. All right. One last data slide I want to show you, which is when thinking about inequality, it's really important to think about not just the United States, but what's happening globally. And so what this shows is the change in income from 1988 to 2008, so it's a little bit dated, but it, it looks pretty similar if you update it to today. And on the x-axis, we take every person in the world, so all 7 billion people, and we just put them uh, from poorest to richest along the x-axis. And then on the y-axis, we look at how much their incomes changed in that 30-year period. And what you can see is at the very poor level, so the very, very left-hand side, the poorest in the world haven't had much change in income. And then you move a little bit to the right, and you see this global poor and global middle class. These are kind of the people that used to be poor in China, let's say. And they've seen an enormous growth in their income over the last 30 years. This is really the rise of China. Okay, you keep on moving to where it dips. Who are those people? Those are the poor people in the United States. Right? That is, the poor people in the United States are richer than the middle class or even many of the rich in India and China and the rest of the world. Right, so that's the poor people in the United States, or middle class in the United States. They have seen very little income growth over the last 30 years. And then all the way to the right, that's the global rich. So that's the global 1%, and they've seen a lot of growth. So that chart, which is known as the elephant chart, to some extent captures in one chart the history of the world in the last 30 or 40 years, which is the rise of China, stagnation of the rich countries' middle and lower classes, and the rich countries, very, very rich, doing extremely well. Okay, so that's all I have for data. We want to kind of now open it up. But let me start before we open it up with um, kind of a, a stylized set of facts. And these, these stylized set of facts are not entirely true, but they're not too far from true. They're kind of rounded numbers and they're kind of rough. But they, they basically reflect what's gone on in the United States uh, in the last 40 years. So if you go look at 1980, to be in the middle 50% or the kind of middle income person in the United States, or family I should say, needed about $50,000 in income. And to be in the top 1%, you needed about 300000 And so if you just take the ratio, the top 1% cutoff level was about six times the cutoff level for them to be in the middle. And now we, we move ahead 40 years, 
And now you need about 65,000, I think it's actually 63, to be an average income person in the United States. And to be <clears throat> top 1%, about 500,000. It's actually about 515 uh, to be in the top 1% right now. And so what you can see is that the top 1% over that 40-year period has grown faster than the middle. They're now about eight times richer than the middle. But everyone's better off. Right, so the question is whether you think this is a good picture or a bad picture, right? Everyone's better off, but the rich are yet better off still, right? And so when you think about inequality, you know, do you think this is great, do you think this is terrible, or kind of somewhere in the middle, right? And unless you can answer that question, you don't really know how to think about inequality. Right, so that's the question. What do you think? Maybe I'll call on Professor Milani. What do you think? Yeah. yeah, what do you think? Yeah. Um, I think it's perfectly fine so far as like if you can keep the gap between the two income brackets like relatively constant. So if it keeps accelerating, then I think that becomes a problem because there are some studies that show that income inequality is a drag on the economy writ large, particularly for those who have to spend more than the poor. So one possibility is it affects GDP growth. That, I mean, that hasn't happened here, right? GDP's, GDP's grown over the last 40 years about 1% a year or so, so much more slowly than it did in the golden years of the 50s and 60s where it was growing about 2% a year. But we don't know whether that's caused by inequality or not. Um, so conceivably, this is fine, but maybe there's some... If GDP growth slows down there, why does it matter? If GDP yeah, so does it matter whether it affects the rich or poor or everybody or what? So, I mean, I think this gets into like factors outside of just, you know, pure productivity and economics, but if the wealthier as this, you know, these numbers show are capturing a larger and larger share of the economy, I tend to think that that gives them more influence and sway to dictate these types of things, which allows them to reinforce these type of advantages that they get, uh, which can have all sorts of other negative spillover effects. So one of them is growth. But the, your second thing, I think, may, maybe refers to political power. Is that what you're kind of referring to? So it might be one reason you object to inequality is political power. Yeah, in the back. Um, there might be something to be said about like a marginal utility of the dollar argument, where you could say uh, the rich getting the additional dollar probably means less to them than it might to the middle income family. So I'm going to put that down as the following, which is lost opportunity, which is in the, in the following sense, which is because we have increased inequality, we could, re, we could be redistributing more, right, because of the argument you made, which is declining marginal utility of income. And so the, the fact of inequality represents some kind of lost opportunity for more re redistribution. But it's not itself bad, it's just that we could be doing better. Is that cons consistent with what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, what else? Yeah. Uh, I think in, way, in the 1980s, when we compare income across so many decades, uh, what is the role of the fall in prices of a lot of goods? In the sense, in the 1980s, the percentage of population in the US who was dying were much lower than the population of people who are dying today. Uh, a large number of goods were very expensive in the 80s or 30s. So, so these data attempt to adjust for inflation, which attempts to adjust for the change in the quality of goods. And the key word there is attempt, right? Because it's not clear how well we can do that because it's very hard. Certain things we have today, we, we just didn't have at all in 1980. And so it's hard to even know how to adjust. But they, they do attempt to adjust for that. But you might say, well, they haven't done it very well. And if they haven't done it very well, the question then is when you bump up the 2020 numbers, whose numbers do you bump up more, the, the middle or the rich? Right, and that we're not, you might have different views about. You might say the middle should be bumped up more than the rich because everyone has an iPhone, 
Right, but you might say the rich should be bumped up more because first class travel is even better than it used to be. Right, and so it's, it's hard to know, but they do attempt to adjust for that. Energy consumption, that has kind of, I mean, if we take kilowatts consumption, that the poor consume much more kilowatts than the rich today, uh, than in the past. We can take something absolute like kilowatt hours consumed. Yeah, so again, they attempt to adjust for that, but you might say, you don't, if I can just reinterpret you, you say you don't care as long as everyone's richer about the inequality because the poor are consuming so much more now. They've all got iPhones and air conditioners, and so they're great. And the fact that the rich are even, even more better off is, is great, even, e even better still, right? We're consuming that more. I'm sorry? Rich are not consuming that more energy than they were consuming in daily. Yeah, so everyone's great. So that's one theory is no problem at all. Anyone else? Yeah. Do you have any figures on purchasing power? Because people aren't really better off if their incomes go up, if all the things that they need to buy price-wise also go up. So these, this atte again attempts to adjust for inflation. So that would, that would automatically adjust for that. Again, assuming they've adjusted correctly. So food prices, for example, have gone down dramatically. And so food's much, much cheaper. And so, um, but housing prices might have gone up in certain regions of the country. This attempts to account for all of that when you make an inflation adjustment. But again, it's, it's crude because how do you compare a house today from a, to a house to 1980 or a car today to a car in 1980? They're really different products. And so you, we, we try and make those adjustments, but you know, they're, they're imperfect. But we do try and do that. And that's, these numbers do have that in there. Uh huh? It, uh, does the focus on percentiles kind of mask a bit who is achieving like very outsized gains or just so I, I think of the rise, so 80s, 90s, uh, compensation being more tied to uh, uh, share, like, the, you know, equity in the company, shareholder value, and, um, and that a few individuals, you know, so take Steve Jobs, are able to, you know, one, one person or a few people are able to essentially create enormous value for everyone. Um, and it's just whereas before one person was unable to do that, now one person is, and so they're capturing a, maybe a fairly larger value yeah. than that would have. Yeah, so let me, let me give you two pieces. I don't have any slides on it, but I can tell you two things we know about that. One, if, if you look at the 1% and you look at their share, where their income is coming from. Is it coming from labor income or capital income? And it's hard to always tell because sometimes if you sell stock, it might have been stock you created, so that's your labor income hiding is capital. But, but to the extent we can tell, it looks like the 1% is earning much more from their own labor than they were in 1950. So some of the rise in 1% really is from their <coughs> returns to their work, which seem to have gone up. Okay. Um, there's something I was going to say. No, I'm blanking on it. Um, so again, we do know it's more, more labor income than, than it used to be. Oh, the other thing I, I, I know what it is. So if you look at who is the 1%, so who is in that category? You know, is it, is it celebrities? Is it CEOs? Is it hedge fund guys and so forth? It's kind of hard to know, but it's some mix, but it seems mostly to be financial industry and some corporate executives. The people you know about, you know, Beyonce, whatever, they're kind of a tiny, tiny fraction of the 1%, not really very important. Um, but it tends to be kind of financial industry and, and, and corporate. But there's some dispute about exactly who is in that category. It turns out, you'd think we'd know that, but it turns out to be kind of hard to know. Uh -huh. I'm just wondering, is the income shown like household income or based on individuals? Because I'm thinking about like the two income trap, how like, you know, women entered the workforce and that kind of covered up some potential to play losses. Yeah, one of the adjustments here that Aut Auten and Splinter make, that one of the debates between Auten and Splinter and the Piketty Saez lines is how you think about households. Because households have changed dramatically over the last 40 years because of much more single income families or you know, single parent families. And also, if, to the extent the parents are married, um, both of them working. And so the household compositions change. And when you adjust for household composition differently, these graphs look really, really different. Um, exactly how you do that is kind of unclear. Right, because again, you need a theory of why you care about inequality then to drive how you make those calculations. Right, so do you care about each individual's consumption or do you care about household consumption? How do you adjust for households uh, if everyone's combining their resources? And you need a theory of inequality to even think about that. But a key driver of the difference in, these, in those two lines 
is how they account for household composition. Those are household. Okay. Yeah, it's household. Yeah. Um, you've got the ratio increasing between the two and the income is not on there. Is there a similar ratio between low income and middle income? Is that inequality also increasing? So I don't have the like bottom 20% number off the top of my head, so I'll say I'm not 100% sure, but this is highly suggestive of that it is, right? As we see the, at each decile, the kind of, it's fanning out even more, right? So um, it's suggestive that probably it, probably it is, right? And the poor are doing the worst, the middle are doing middle, and the rich are doing the best. Yeah. Should we... Uh, Going. Yeah, so one of the um, things we wanted to talk about is, you know, thinking about why you care. That is, what was your response intuitively to the stylized set of facts? The next question is, you know, what should we do? And we have some slides prepared on some of the things that you might suggest, but we thought we'd get some suggestions for you as to what, what should be done about inequality. This is what's, off the, what's on the top of your head about policies that you care about? Probably see a lot of these if you watch Democratic debates. It's pretty much all they're about. Yeah, what do you want to do? Tax the one percent. So how? <laughs> Wealth tax or what? What? How? Well, you, you did ways of doing it, but one easy way is just to see in terms of income on a certain cap, if you pay very high amount of tax. So just raise taxes generally. Yeah. Um, kind of along with that, what about specifically raising like capital gains taxes? Yeah, so I'll call this taxes on capital. And it, taxes on capital include, you can increase capital gains taxes themselves, tax rates. You can change how we tax capital gains. Or also, you know, Warren and um, Sanders have proposed taxes on wealth directly. And those are all similar or different approaches to doing something similar, which is increasing the tax on capital income generally. Right? And we can talk about different ways of doing that, what the merits are of the different ways of doing it, but they're all sort of on the same direction, which is not just raising taxes, but raising particular taxes, taxes on, on capital. Uh -huh. uh, you know, rather than taxing people, you can decide to reinvest in people, so try to offer uh, public tertiary education. Oh, let's do education. That's a good one. So training. So that's um, lift up the poor rather than bring down the rich. What else? Yeah. Yeah, I guess you could also regulate. Um, so you mentioned antitrust and driving wages down. I guess you could use antitrust regulation to maybe deal with that. Sorry, can you get to? I said, I said regulate. Regulate. Yeah. Regulation of, for instance, um, you mentioned earlier the uh, the, the wages being driven down uh, and antitrust issues, so you can regulate labor monopsony. So, right, Eric Poser on our practice is working a lot on this right now, which is how to think about. Um, wages in a world where there's only a few employers in a given region and there's a lot of very low labor mobility. People don't change jobs very much. And so in that world, how do you think about uh, uh, regulating wages? And what else can you do to regulate wages? Minimum wage, Minimum wage right. right. This is a, a very common proposal right now in the United States. Lots of cities and states are raising minimum wage you know, sort of 15, they're doubling the minimum wage. But it's a really dramatic change of what we're seeing in the minimum wage. Yeah, what else? Yeah, in addition to minimum wage, you have like the exempt minimum wage. You have overtime laws. So you can start regulating um, hours or ways of paying employees. So is it similar to so if you use so, like the exempt minimum wage today is about $58,000. So if you want to employ um, 
workers that would classify it as exempt workers having discretion in their work, uh, generally, like in simplification. Uh, if you raise that higher, um, if you employ uh, employees that do that sort of work, um, you have to pay them more, and then if they're not employed in that category, you're going to have to pay them overtime. Yeah, so this, I'll put this in the Fair Labor Standards Act change. Fair Labor Standards Act. This seems to be broken, so over here. Um, these are all. <laughs> um, right, this is actually, I don't know if you followed a Trump proposal to pull back an Obama proposal to expand the Fair Labor Standards Act's coverage. Um, so that's kind of a live issue right now is what we're going to do with that. Uh -huh. um, you could expand the earned income tax credit or like expand Pell Grants. So you can raise taxes here. You can also just make the taxes more progressive, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, if you care about inequality in the sense that it reproduces unequal in in life outcomes, you can ensure uh, basic quality of life by providing more services, um, such so as healthcare, healthcare, education, you know. Healthcare, yeah. Right. One thing I don't have. Maybe do you know the answer to this inequality in health outcomes. Does it reflect? And it does? Uh, it's complicated. We spend more on lower income per capita, but they have less access. And so I think most people think that uh, they end up spending more per person because they, they have invested along the way. So they take Medicare. Medicare for lower income will spend more per capita. And one of the reasons people think that's true is because we haven't invested a lot for much of people's lives when they're poor. And so they end up sicker when they're on Medicare, so they spend more per capita on that. And health outcomes then are worse for poor than for rich. Yeah. So we have inequality in health, not just in income, which I didn't didn't show you, right? Uh -huh. What about policy around housing? Since people have most of their wealth comes from their own ownership of their property, and then they can invest it. Yeah. So um, I didn't show you. Uh, I don't have off the top of my head. Uh, if you break down spending as a fraction of income for the poor and the rich. And the question is what they're spending on. And are the poor spending more on, say, housing than the rich are as a fraction of their income? And therefore, if you want to think about you know, housing costs increasing, that's making the given you know, number of square footage that they're getting in a house, are the poor kind of worse off in the sense that their housing prices have gone up relative to the rich housing prices? And I don't know the answer to that, but it might be that um, that's an important component of, of the well-being of the poor. Not so much addressing inequality, but again, addressing you know, how well the poor are doing. One way to think about this, I get one second, is um, some of these proposals like health care and housing are, I'm going to just go back a slide, are addressing how well the poor people are doing given their income. And other ones, like let's you know, tax the rich, are saying, well, let's change the difference between the rich and the poor. Right, so when you look at these stylized facts, this was kind of the goal was to, was to get, you know, what's your intuition? Is it really about narrowing these differences or is it really about taking the middle there and making sure they're doing pretty well? Right? And what you care about will then drive which sets of policies you, um, you want to support. Right? Yeah? This might be drastic, but you could not allow intergenerational wealth transfer. So I'm gonna, I'm, I don't have room for taxes anymore, but certainly um, inheritance taxes or um, uh, um, estate taxes and raising them have been a prominent proposal. They've been um, narrowed quite a lot in the last 10 years or so. And we could go back to where we were or even make them stronger than we used to be. Universal basic income for people below a certain threshold? Yeah. EBI. Um, common proposal kind of fits in the tax package, although I ran out of room in the tax, because it really is just taking money, giving. In the tax world, we think of everything as um, taxing and spending is kind of one of a piece. And this is just like a negative tax, if you will. And so having making the taxes more progressive by having it be negative on lots of people um, would be one way to help the poor. And that, that, what it does is might lift up the, the low and, and middle, 
and at the simultaneously you can press the difference between the rich and the poor, right? Because you take the money from the rich, you kind of give it to poor people. I'll show you in a minute if we get to it, uh, a policy kind of a simulation that looked at that, and we can see how much that does. All right. Um, you want to do minimum wage, or should we just do taxes, or what do you want to do? Let me just show you one thing with taxes to respond to this, and then we'll do minimum wages. So, so taxes. Um, oh yeah, the key, point. the key point. Thank you. <laughs> you want to do it? <laughs> so, in thinking about all of these po proposals, um, again, this is a class we teach across across the Midway. Uh, it's half law students, half half booth. We just teach it at, in booth. Um, we wanted to think about how can you analyze all these different things and make sure you're kind of getting it right. And the framework attempts to be in some sense value neutral, which is the very first bullet point is, you know, what do you care about is the first question. So you can come in with your own values. Right? You might say, I think inequality is terrible because uh, the middle class envies the rich and it's just bad for that reason. Or you might say, no, I think it's not bad or I think it's bad because I've lost opportunity or bad because of whatever you care about, you can bring to this framework. But the, the important thing to do is identify why you're here. What do you care about? What's driving the problem? Okay. Then once you think about that and have some kind of policy proposal, the middle two bullet points are there to just kind of make sure that you dot your I's and cross your T's. Right, so the second one is you need to do a full accounting. If you're going to give money to somebody, like say raise the minimum wage, you have to explain where the money's coming from. But you can't assume a free lunch. Right? Everything kind of has to add up. And so people that want to raise the minimum wage, let's give the poor uh, a, a, a raise, they say. Well, they, don't, they never kind of say, well, who's giving them the raise? And you have to say that in order to have all the pieces accounted for. Right, so where does the money go? Where does it come from? And then this, the third bullet point is also important, which is most proposals, indeed almost all proposals that we have in the United States, will take effect in a market economy. And that means things are going to adjust. When you put in policy X, other pieces of the economy are going to move around. So for example, if you raise the corporate tax, you have to say who's going to pay those extra corporate taxes, right? That's the second bullet point. And then what's going to happen to prices and wages, right? So when economists study the raising the corporate tax, they often say well, what happens is that probably wages go down, right? That is workers probably pay the corporate tax. So if you thought, oh, we should tax corporations more, they're rich, that's going to be a good way to make the system more progressive and you didn't focus on the third bullet point, you probably proposed a policy which does not achieve the goals you are trying to achieve. Right? You're trying to make the system more progressive and help the poor, and your proposal didn't work because markets adjusted. What happens is corporations reduced employment in response to that policy and made the workers worse off rather than the people you want to be worse off worse off. Right? So it's really important to think about equilibrium effects and market effects. A lot of people resist this. They say, oh, you know, the economists doing their neoliberal thing. They shouldn't, shouldn't, be bothered, shouldn't bother us. It's really important. In some sense, thinking about this is your best friend. If you really care about having your policy work, you really want to make sure you think through how it's going to work in a market economy and what's going to adjust. Otherwise, you're just being symbolic. Right? If you really care, you've got to think through this stuff. And the last thing is, what constraints are you assuming? So for example, Piketty and Sias the two like, famous inequality guys that are advising Liz Warren, they say they want a wealth tax, and they don't even care where the money goes. In fact, if the rich avoid it, say, by just working less, so there's just less money in the system, they're really happy with that. Why? They just want the rich to have less money. It's all they care about. And why? Because they think the rich have too much political power. Right? So their main goal in their wealth tax, when they face criticism from economists about whether it's going to work or not, they always back up and say, well, all that matters is the rich have less because they have too much political power. And by giving them less, they'll have less political power. And the answer is, well, you know, not so clear. That's true. And why are you assuming that the best way to give them less political power 
is to tax him rather than say, just change the rules for donations to political campaigns, for example. Right? Why not address the problem directly? They're assuming without saying that there's some kind of constraint on policy that forces them to address political power problems via tax rather than addressing it directly. So that's the framework we have. Then the question is how you think about these problems within that framework. But I should let you come in and talk about the minimum wage. I'm going to try to take this framework and I'm going to try to apply it to the problem of, uh, or the proposal that we ought to use a minimum wage uh, to address, uh, say, income inequality, or if you care just about poverty, to address the problems of, of, of poverty. So let me just jump ahead a little bit. Um, and let me just motivate uh, this policy. You've seen this figure before. These are two slides on one that David already put up that shows that uh, weekly wages over time have changed at different rates for poor people in the bottom 10 percentile to people that are in the 95th percentile. And if you're really concerned, like I'm having trouble reading this graph, like are, are some slopes, oops, what the heck happened here? Uh, let's, okay. If you're really concerned about, uh, yeah, just getting back to that. If you're concerned about, you know, can I read that graph? I'm going to put up a graph very quickly. Yep, you just pass it up, this guy right here. Yeah. This is a graph that uh, shows you the same sort of thing, except it says, I'm going to look at different percentages of the wage distribution. So the richest people are here, the poorest people are here. This is going to tell me, um, uh, I'm going to use a metric that's going to, it's changes in log wages, but it's a, a way to think about percentage changes uh, in wages. And you see people, uh, whether you're talking about women or you're talking about men, people at the left end of the wage distribution are growing less fast, their wages are growing less fast than folks that are at the right tail of the wage distribution. And that's the concern. And the question is, you know, can we use uh, minimum wages to address this? But before we jump to using that, one retort that people often give is that, yeah, it, it is true that the poor over a long span have experienced lower rates of wage growth. But recently, that's been changing. This is a figure that shows from 1998 to 2000, uh, basically this year, uh, breaks down wage growth by quartile. So uh, if you're uh, in the highest quartile, the fourth quartile, you're yellow. If you're in the lowest quartile, you're blue. And you see right now, since say about 2012, the growth rate of the, those that are in the first percentile is faster than the growth rate of, say, those that are in the fourth percentile. That is to say, the poor wa wage rates of the poor are going faster than those of the wealthy. In response to that, some people say, OK, but hold on. The reason why it's growing is not because the system has changed. It's because we have minimum wage. Minimum wage laws have been adopted, uh, have continuously been adopted, but in recent past have been adopted. And maybe that's what's explained during this period why you're seeing your wage growth. Uh, and so there's some research that was done by Tedeschi and others that try to break this down. And they do find that, in fact, it is true that the minimum wage has helped wage growth for here he's looking at the bottom tercile rather than quartile, so the bottom third of the population. But the difficulty is the minimum wage is only explaining about 20% of the growth that you're seeing at the bottom. OK. So that's kind of a setting to which you can respond and say something like, look, if we really want to help people at the bottom th uh, third or bottom quartile, we should increase the minimum wage a little bit more. OK? That's the setting. Now the question is, can we use minimum wage to further reduce income inequality? And the answer to this question really is going to uh, depend on two factors which map on nicely to the framework that David presented. One, we want to look at who pays. Two, we want to look at what the equilibrium effects are. So I'm going to break this down or translate that into two points. First is we're going to assume that there's no equilibrium response. We're going to assume that when you raise wages, minimum wages, there's no reduction in employment of the poor. And then we're going to ask, given that occurs, we're just going to try to figure out who wins and who loses across the income distribution, taking very seriously that somebody has to pay for those wage increases. Fair enough? And then we're going to step back and we're going to say, let's look at, let's relax this assumption that employment is not going to adjust. And let's look at what happens if we raise minimum wage, what happens to the employment of the poor? Does that make sense? And so this is really more about the framework that I'm going to apply than the actual answers, although I will try to give you some answers. Okay? The honest to goodness truth is we still need to, to study it a little bit more, but, but the framework is the key insight. Okay, 
So let's hold the amount of employment in the US constant. Let's raise the minimum wage and think about the costs and benefits of this across the income distribution. So first, let's think about the benefits. What are the benefits of, a, of, of an increase in minimum wage? Obvious, wages rise. Uh, and we want to know who's getting the benefit, who are the beneficiaries of this increase in wages. When we think minimum wage, so it's got to be the poor, but it's going to be a little bit more complicated than that. Because we want to know who holds those minimum wage jobs. The households they're from, what part of the income distribution are they part of? Then when we think about costs, we want to think, well, minimum wage, that money has to come from somewhere. Typically, when you increase labor costs, that means that the companies that employ these workers have to raise their prices. Maybe they have to sacrifice a little bit of profits, but maybe it's some combination of that. But, but prices might increase. Then you might ask, who is paying those prices? That is to say, who's consuming the goods that are produced by minimum wage workers? Are they other lower income people or other higher income people? Does that make sense? So we want to decompose those. So there's a dis dispute on who it is that benefits from an increase in minimum wage. OK, this is very puzzling to many people, I think, at first blush, right? You're increasing the minimum wage. Surely the poor benefit. But it's not always the, minimum, the poor that are sitting in minimum wage jobs. Think of yourself in high school working at a fast food joint. You are not low income. Look at you today, right? You're from higher income families, or you will be part of a higher income family. And so if you look empirically where it is, what part of the income distribution holders of minimum wage jobs lie, they're kind of relatively broadly distributed. Okay? So if you look at the percentage, if you, if you uh, group families by income quintile, okay, so this is 20% 20, 20 parts, so quintile means five parts, and you say, which of those families have minimum wage jobs? And it's basically 20%, roughly across the board. Okay, so that's one argument made for why minimum wage actually benefits both the rich and the poor, wealthy families and poor families. But again, this is in dispute. More recent evidence, uh, by, so that last, pay, that last uh, uh, table is from uh, Tom McCurdy, but there's a, a follow-up paper done by Arindajit Dubé that suggests that in fact there is greater concentration of lower income uh, folks in minimum wage jobs. So what he does, he looks at what the, the amount that a minimum wage change does to income for people that are in the lower parts of the income distribution versus the highest, looking empirically at states that have adopted and not adopted minimum wage laws. And he finds that poor tend to benefit more. Even then, there's a little bit of complication. You have to do a full accounting, because if you earn more, that means you're going to get less benefits from the government, because government transfers are means tested. And so he does acknowledge that, in fact, that when you account for reductions in government transfers that you get because you got a higher wage, that the benefits are a little bit smaller. There's still benefits, but they're smaller for the poor. Does that make sense? So now we've looked at the income distribution, or the distribution across the income uh, uh, distribution of the benefit side of minimum wage. Now let's look at the cost side of minimum wage. We think the costs are disproportionately borne by lower income households. Okay? Uh, and you can see this, for example, you can either look at income uh, quintiles by family, or you can look at consumption quintiles, like how much people, how much families are consuming. And when you look at that, with income, it seems a little bit more evenly balanced. That is to say, are you consuming goods produced by minimum wage? workers. But if you look at consumption, you find that the poor tend to consume more. Uh, 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 that is to say, families that consume less also tend to consume from uh, firms that employ minimum wage workers. Does that make sense? So some of the, the costs are borne by the poor as well. Does that make sense? So let's just pause there for a second and just think about this, which is if you want to help the poor by a minimum wage increase, and you try to like say who's going to benefit across the income distribution from this, yes, you will get slightly more benefits maybe, or at least it's under dispute, but you'll also get slightly higher costs. And what's really important is thinking about those net benefits. And there's a dispute on what those net benefits are for the poor. Does that make sense? OK, and that's before we talk about whether or not employment changes. Now, one thing that you guys are probably thinking about is, well, when you increase wages, it's not obvious that it's all, always passed on to consumers in the form of higher prices. It's possible that the owners of the firms they lose some of their profits. And that's true. And so there are studies that look at this. This is an example of a study not from the US, but from Hungary, that looked at a change in the minimum wage in Hungary 
uh, around the year 2000, this is the change in price. Basically, their minimum wage from, went from the level that's typical in the United States to, uh, to the level that's typical in France, not in terms of level, but in the ratio of wages, uh, of the minimum wage to the median wage. But there was an increase. And then they try to look at, in the red line, it's the amount, the, the change in firm prices. So that's the costs that are passed on to consumers. And blue is in the profits. And so what you see is profits do decline a little bit. Uh, and prices increase. The, the allocation across the two of them is that about a, a, out of 100% change, 75% is seen in higher prices, and 25% is seen as in lower profits. Does that make sense? OK. If we were to do even full accounting, we would ask ourselves questions like, well, what is the income distribution of people that own firms that employ minimum wage workers, right? Now, let's step back. That gives you a framework for thinking about the first point. Now, let's think about equilibrium effects. It's the age old debate, right? If for some reason, people work, focus on this debate first rather than the original debate, uh, the original point, but I, wanna, I did the other one first because it's, it's almost as important, if not more important. But now, let's look at equilibrium effects. That is to say, when I increase the minimum wage, will employment levels decline? Basic economic theory suggests the answer is yeah, right? Demand for labor is downward sloping like demand for lots of things. If you increase the price, you're going to demand less. That's what basic economic 101 theory tells you. And there is some empirical evidence suggesting that's true. Again, just to not toss too many studies at you, I'm going to stick with the same study from Hungary that was recently done. It showed that after the adoption of a minimum wage or an increase in the minimum wage in Hungary, you actually did see a decline, a mild decline in employment. Okay. But that's just one study. If we look across studies, you basically find, uh, you know, on average, it's about zero. This is different studies with different point estimates of how much they increase, or how much an increase in minimum wage increases employment or decreases employment. And the average kind of is zero. Here we plot them as a distribution, and the mean is kind of around zero. Now, that doesn't mean there's not an effect. It's just that our empirical evidence across a range of studies suggests that it's not a significant effect on employment. OK? So in this context, what you'd probably want to say is zero employment effects. Now, if you're a little bit more curious, you'd wonder, well, how do we reconcile this? I always thought demand curves slope down. How are we getting zero effects? And this get, brings us back to another uh, issue that we've been talking about. Some people suggest that what's really going on is that there is concentration of employers uh, in the labor market. Okay, there's labor monopsony, and labor monopsony means that uh, you get the owner of the firm gets a lot of profits, okay, and can suppress wages. And so the idea here is that maybe what's going on is that when you increase minimum wage, you're just eating away at those profits. Okay, you're not really uh, decreasing the amount of employment. And there's some evidence in favor in, in, in support of this. So Azar and others have done this study where they say, look, let's look at different jobs, say store clerks, retail clerks, cashiers, and we say. Let's look at market, labor markets where employment is concentrated versus not concentrated and see the impact on employment of increasing minimum wage. And what they find is when there's not a lot of concentration, when the market is very competitive, in fact, minimum wage decreases employment. But in places where it's not concentrated, okay, where labor, uh, uh, employer concentration is high, then in fact, increased minimum wage doesn't decrease employment. Does that make sense? Now, why is that important? Well. It might be important because, A, you listen to what David said and said, if the issue is labor monopsony, maybe we've got to tackle that rather than minimum wage. Alternatively, if you still like the minimum wage idea, you want to at least think about, well, do we want to have different rules about increasing the minimum wage depending on what the concentration of the labor market is? In competitive markets, we want to be careful about that because you could end up hurting the poor by costing them their jobs. But in areas where, it's lab where there is high concentration, it might be less damaging. The equilibrium effects might be less damaging. OK, so just to sum up, Maybe minimum wage doesn't affect employment, at least in, in places where there's labor concentration. And even if it doesn't affect employment, however, you still have the issue that it's not obvious that you're benefiting the poor when you raise the minimum wage. More research is required, but more importantly, you should keep this framework in mind as you think about this and other problems. I'll add one other thing to that. Please. There we go. Which is, uh, when thinking about minimum wage, there's also an alternative, which is the earned income tax credit, or the EBI. So you're thinking about whether you support the minimum wage, you also have to be thinking about what constraints are causing you to think that's the policy you want, instead of policies that are roughly substitutable for the minimum wage, such as EBI or the earned income tax credit. 
And those will have different economics and different effects because rather than making an employer pay for the increase in wages, taxpayers generally pay for it. Right, and so this will look very differently, different than the minimum wage. The analysis will be different, but they're substitutable in the sense they do the same thing, right? Particularly the earned income tax credit, which is a wage subsidy. Oh, yeah. I was wondering what sort of incentives would be created if instead of having a flat minimum wage for all companies, you created a kind of government mandated profit sharing scheme where companies that were, weren't in the red and weren't just working even but were actually profitable would have to redistribute some of those profits to their workers. And I was wondering what the effect of that is. So one of the first things I'd ask is, uh, how does that differ depending on whether or not you have a, uh, uh, what percentage of your, your, your costs are labor costs versus capital costs? Because if I were a company, like say I ran a ski resort, and I knew that I had to do that on a per capita basis, I would try to automate so I could get rid of workers. Or I would try to split my company into pieces so that there's sections where I can take profits and only have capital as my input rather than labor as well. So we want to think about those sorts of avoidance issues. It's gonna, it's got to be linked to, to the organization of the firm. It reminds me of the old debate in the '80s about employee stock ownership, right? So one of the things we tried to do in the '80s, even dating back to the '70s, was increase the ownership of of um, companies by employees. Basically, you'd have this old, you know, Marxian capital versus labor fight, and you could solve that by having the labor own the capital, if you will, right? And so they would get a share of the profits, and. I think the data on that, I thought it, originally the data was just disastrous. It didn't work. But I thought more recent studies showed that it's actually sort of OK. Um, but some of them, the, the employee stock ownership plans, the ESOPs, are basically just tax shelters. And people are using them rather than helping workers, they're using them to shelter income. But I thought there's some studies showing that they are fairly effective in some cases. And, and I have one follow-up question, which was um, something Something that was more like increasing worker power within the company. Something like Germany, where uh, workers have to have a certain number of board seats on a company. Yeah, um, what effect did that have? Um, you know, it's hard to know when you compare it to Germany, but one of the uh, causes that we had up here was decline in unions. And the union, unions were kind of a way of having worker power. And there, so some people attribute some of the de increase in inequality to the decline in unionization in the United States. And so, you could either make unions e easier to have, or you could do some kind of mandated worker power on the, on the board. I think the studies that I'm familiar with, again, I'm not 100% not certain of the data here, is that when you put a worker on the board, they act just like anyone else on the board. Right? They end up wanting the company to maximize profits. And so it doesn't help that much. But do you know more of the other studies? No, I, I, I've heard completely of it. Some yeah. people suggest that when you put it on there, they act a little bit more like partnerships, and then they do things like want to have more labor share because it benefits employees and things like that. But that uh, uh, has problems because it shrinks the pie of the company. Why? Because they're not doing the most efficient thing, and so they're losing out to competitors. And even if all the United States firms have the same rules within a market, the problem is it wouldn't apply to, for example, foreign firms that are importing goods that are substitutes for that. And so it gets to be a little bit complicated, but, but, but I think what I want to stress is that you use the exact same analysis to address that. You would say, assume companies behave exactly the same, and all I'm doing is I'm just, you know, increasing the, you know, paying the employee in stock or as a percentage of the profits or putting them on the board, say, okay, are they really benefiting or not? And then I'd say, now let's think about the equilibrium effects. How is the market going to respond to that? Uh, and if those companies are behaving optimally, like David suggests, there should be no equilibrium effects. All you're doing is, but you're not having much of an effect necessarily on the, on, the, on the workers. But if they are responding by increasing the labor share and things like that from that which is profit maximizing, then the company could be less successful, in which case the employees just are going to share in that payment. And other companies that don't comply with that constraint or don't have to comply with that constraint might benefit. But that's the, the kind of the two step that you want to take to figure out if that's a good policy or there's something else. <clears throat> like, for example, you know, when I was listening to you, I thought, well, how about this? Why don't we just pay the company in stock? Not to put them on the board. The workers. Yeah, yeah, put it, yeah pay, the, pay the workers, sorry, in stock. Not just in cash, but in stock. And that way they're sharing in whatever profits or producer surplus that are, is being made by the owners. That's ESOPs. That's ESOPs, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was going to look at research into um, the economy so that we can wait. So it is differentiated by saying 
um, for example, in Australia, we actually do pay people less to get undergraduate. Um, so we do differentiate in that way to different categories. I have not looked into that. I don't know if the literature has looked into that and, and looked at the difference. It's not at the top level that people, people have talked about, but it might be a way to address some of these issues and change who within the income distribution can benefit. That's for sure. Sure, sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It just seems like a lot of these cases are and if, if, the if you know the academics, the bright and best can't figure it out, how can we use this framework to craft these policies? Well, look, there's always uncertainty, right? So, so you know, you got to kind of do your best. Uh, look, we don't even know if inequality is increased or not, right? We, we can you can look at this graph. Say, I don't even know what our starting point is. Um, I don't know. What do you? Well, here's the thing. Let's suppose you don't know. What are you going to do? Now, one possibility is you can say, I don't care about the theory, and I don't care about the empirical data, I'm just going to do it. The problem with that is that there's lots of people that want to do things, even though they don't have the data, right? So some people want to do it because they're like, I think inequality is increased, I don't necessarily have the data that, that it has, or that, that, it's that, that my solution is going to work. Somebody on the other side will be like, I just don't want immigrants in this country, I don't like it. And we say, oh, but the country benefits from it, or, or the theoretical benefits, they just ignore it. I don't think that it's a very constructive thing to have a... Uh, uh, discussion where anybody can just say they want to do something without having at least some theory in mind that motivates their point, uh, and then hopefully, if possible, empirical evidence. But acknowledging that empirical evidence might be lacking. Also, but I just think that's a more informed way to go about proposing policy changes. Also, one other thing, because a lot of the work I do is on climate change, and it faces this problem really in space, which is we haven't a clue what's going to happen in 50 years with climate change. We just don't know. And the question is how you make policy in the face of that uncertainty. And in that area, you kind of decide how risk averse you want to be, right? And then decide kind of what are the bad cases you want to avoid and try to make policy to avoid those bad cases. And you could apply a similar approach here where you're trying to make policy in the face of deep uncertainty about what the facts are and then decide, well, what's kind of the policies that you can adopt that kind of avoid the really bad cases? might be one way to think about it. It's certainly the way we approach it in climate change, because we haven't a clue what's going to happen in 50 years. Right? You might do the same thing with inequality, where you can say, which of these policies, unlikely to cause a lot of harm, but may do some good, depending on what we think like, the likely facts are. Yeah. On that note, um, do you guys know how like, the research is handling assumptions about the macro structure of the economy? Because you know, we've seen this. Deindustrialization de of you know large economies, which some people correlate to some increase in inequality, and then you know we're slowly moving into more and more of a service sector economy, where it is kind of harder to kind of tack on like, what is the value of your skill. Like you know there is some job losses, and how much does that equate into what we're seeing in this loss of wages? Um, like how are how's the research handling those kind of sectors right now? I mean, I, I don't think that we have necessarily a different methodology for pricing labor when you're producing a prop of physical product versus labor, like say teaching. Uh, we have, I, I don't think the economics of those things uh, differ a lot. Uh, there, I think you're implicitly talking about differences in the value of labor, uh, but I don't know why that would depend on the product. But I know, what, is, what does the automation literature say? Because that, that's kind of going to this point, right? There's a large literature on what we can expect from automation. Do you know what that literature says? I think there's a deep conflict in that literature. So, the, so even like, uh, so for example, take early Darwin Asamoglu, uh, this person that's been doing a lot of research uh, on automation. Uh, the early literature suggests that uh, uh, impact, that there's not a big impact uh, due to automation. So you have companies, and here's a great way to characterize it. If you look at within company, some of the recent evidence suggests that Companies that turn to automation uh, experience uh, uh, higher profits and higher employment. But sectors where that occurs experience lower employment. And so what could be happening is companies that automate, they're more economically successful, they grow, even though their labor share is a little bit lower, the total employment rises, and then the entire sector, however, is losing when you have automation. That's what the data suggests, but I think that we're still trying to learn about what the impact of automation is going to be, in part because We've seen a ton. I mean, we haven't seen robots, but you yeah, know, truck you, drivers are going to be out of work in ten years. The question is, what happens? Right? We don't know the answer. Yeah, we are out of time. <laughs>
So thank you very much.